The year is 1881, and the Russian Tsar Alexander II has, this morning, signed the Loris Melikov Constitution, a document that provided the first timid steps towards a constitutional monarchy. Later that day, whilst riding in his carriage, members of the revolutionary anarchist movement People's Will attacked his carriage with bombs, severely injuring Alexander, who passed away within an hour. There had been six attempted assassinations on his life since he came into power, with this one succeeding, and Alexander was no exception during the late 19th and early 20th century. A small part of this revolutionary anarchist movement did not shy away from violence. Until the outbreak of the First World War, anarchists were a very serious threat to the aristocracy, the monarchy, presidents and government officials. Today we'll look into some of their most notorious terror attacks during this era, which include the assassination of a French and United States president among others, and we'll look at three prominent founding members of this school of thought. In 1885, Émile Zola published his novel Germinal, depicting a strike of coal miners in northern France. It features a Russian anarchist émigré, Souverine, preaching violent action to the strikers. Not only in Zola's novel did anarchists preach violent revolution, though a vast majority of people that identified themselves with the anarchist movement did not pursue a route of violence and terror. Some of the most notable assassinations in the years we're talking about were committed by anarchists. Which assassinations? Well, there were bombings, for example, in the Theatre Bellecour in Lyon, though ironically only a waiter was killed instead of the target middle class. In 1884, Louis Chavet, a young gardener with anarchist convictions, killed the mother superior of a convent in Marseille. The last decade of the 19th century saw a peak in terrorist attacks assassinations and a diversification of the targets. Four Paris police officers in 1892 and 20 Spanish theatergoers in 1893. The Moral Affair in 1906 caused the deaths of 24 bystanders as the Spanish king and his wife held a procession on their wedding day when an anarchist threw a bomb towards them. Between these years, besides the deaths of many bystanders, prominent individuals were also murdered. We already touched upon the murder of Tsar Alexander II. In 1898, the Empress of Austria-Hungary, Elizabeth, was stabbed through her heart with a needle by the Italian anarchist Luigi Luceni. Four years earlier, the French President Carnot was stabbed by an anarchist after delivering a speech and after serving six years as the Spanish Prime Minister, Antonio Canovas del Castillo was shot at the Thermal Bath Resort by the Italian anarchist Michela Angiolillo. Two of the aforementioned assassinations were by Italians, and if we look at Italy, it was not spared any regicides. In 1900, King Umberto I of Italy was shot four times by Gaetano Bresci. So, all these events were in Europe, but some of my viewers from the United States may know that in 1901 the President of the United States, William McKinley, was shot by a Polish-American anarchist. Quite a list for a loosely organized bunch that never truly mobilized nor displayed any proper internal cohesion. These events have permanently marked the anarchist, both in novels, papers and public opinion. The word anarchy became synonymous with chaos and destruction. The anarchist with a long thick beard and a black cloak hiding the bomb he was carrying was represented in caricatures, police photos and political drawings. Blackwood's magazine in Great Britain concluded, the mad dog's nature comes closest to that of the anarchist. Theodore Roosevelt proclaimed that anarchism was a crime against humanity, while in Europe, financial opportunists attempted to squeeze a penny out of the situation by selling insurance policies covering the risk of anarchist activities. It's one way to earn a living. Another element has been attributed to anarchism in the past century, failure. The notion of anarchy, a world without government, coined by Proudhon, a 19th century philosopher, is rejected by intellectuals. They see it as an odd utopia that mistakenly believes in the good of mankind. 
20th century political thought is drenched with Hobbesian realism. People will never be good, government is necessary, and force is inevitable. This train of thought saw the anarchist as a strange figure, if not a revolutionary and immoral one. The hostile view of anarchism defined by the period of the 1890s to 1914 was formed by semi-fictive novels about the European aristocracy and the middle class being under threat. You know, aside from all the assassinations and terrorist attacks. Ernest Alfred Vizitelli wrote the book The Anarchists in 1911. He claimed not to be at war with anarchism, but to objectively describe the development of the branches within anarchist thought of the past 40 years. Nevertheless, the book contains strong moral disapproval. When in 1914 the Great War broke out and all-consuming nationalism became the norm, anarchism faded in the background. Anarchism became an even more dangerous deviation from society than it was considered previously. If we want to understand this hostile view towards anarchism, we have to focus on the variety of anarchist theories and practices. An absolute minority was concerned with violence and assassinations. As a theory, anarchism finds its roots in the intellectual tradition of the English freethinker William Godwin, the French socialist Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, and one of the greatest of Russian authors, Leo Tolstoy. According to some anarchists, the philosophy behind anarchism can be traced back to the Chinese Lao Tse, the Greek hedonists and cynics, Zeno, the founder of the school of Stoicism, and various Western sects before and after the Reformation. Those views can be upheld if one agrees with the notion that the core of anarchism, liberation from authority and equality of all peoples, has always been the primary objective of human aspiration. This movement's ideals were seen in settlements of the socialist utopians such as Charles Fourier and Robert Owen and the revolutionary individualism of Mikhail Bakunin. Principally, anarchists reject all institutions, party discipline and dogmatics. Anarchist writings convey a form of doctrinaire vulnerability, a primitive form of elementary belief that is exposed and poignant to the rationalist. It has a fundamental and what could be considered naive attachment to freedom. Among the most revered individuals of anarchist thought are the Prince Pyotr Kropotkin, Emma Goldman and Enrico Malatesta. Kropotkin, descendant of the Rurik dynasty that ruled Russia before the Romanov dynasty, renounced his princely title out of sympathy with the oppressed. After a life of revolution, incarceration and sensational escapes, he settled in England, where he influenced a younger generation with the call to permanent revolution through words, writings, swords, guns and dynamite. Such violent language contradicted his personality. The Socratic piano playing Kropotkin was known as a friendly, wise and charitable. He called for a revolution but condemned the terrorist acts that occurred in the last decade of the 19th century, as he considered them serving no political purpose. Bernard Shaw, a close friend of Kropotkin, noted this contradiction in his personality, reminiscing. He was amiable, close to being a saint. His only weakness was that he kept predicting war within two weeks. Shaw saw anarchism as indefensible because it could not explain why. If a person is pure in its core, society now is rotten. To Kropotkin, however, the fundamental pureness of mankind was never in doubt. Kropotkin, in his conviction, supported critical historic events such as the growth of democracy and local institutions such as the British Lifeboat Association, which he saw as a proof of voluntary cooperation being solidified in human nature. He did not condemn all of European society and admitted that some countries ranked higher than others in terms of quality of life. On this basis, he was one of the few anarchists that did not denounce the Great War. Kropotkin firmly believed the war was necessary in order to fight the most oppressing regime of them all, the autocratic German Reich under Kaiser Wilhelm II. Kropotkin drafted the Manifesto of the Sixteen together with Jean Grave, voicing their support for the Allied powers. This belief did cost him many anarchist friends and supporters, though he had already cemented his name as one of the most prominent anarchist intellectuals. 
Kropotkin had followers all over the globe. On the other side of the Atlantic, Emma Goldman had a background that was completely different, although she was originally from Russia as well. Daughter of Jewish parents, she emigrated to the United States at the age of 16. Overwhelmed by abuse of power and oppression in the American factories, she was converted to anarchism by Johann Most. Kropotkin's writings convinced her that his form of anarchism was the righteous one. Together with her partner, Alexander Bergman, she plotted to kill Henry Frick Clay, an industrialist. The reason? One of the most violent labor disputes in the history of the United States, the Homestead Strike of 1892, where workers opposed Henry Frick Clay, resulting in the deaths of multiple men. Clay survived the assassination attempt and Bergman was convicted. Goldman, however, walked free. She walked free from the charges of being complicit to the murder of United States President McKinley as well, though the perpetrator, Leon Solgoc, asked her for reading recommendations and went to her lectures. Goldman established a magazine, Mother Earth, and opposed the death penalty and war. The magazine ruled in 1893 referred to her as the modern Jeanne d'Arc. After 1901, the fear of anarchism in the United States led to the government singling her out and eventually, in 1919, she was sent into exile to Russia. It did not take long for Goldman to become completely disillusioned with the Bolshevik Revolution and she went into exile in Western Europe. Enrico Malatesta, an Italian anarchist, achieved the same level of fame of Kropotkin drew to his incredible escapes. He once escaped from the prison island Lampedusa with a rowing boat and another time he escaped in a crate, labelled for delivery to Argentine. A small bearded man, he spent his life working with conspirators throughout large European cities. He quit his medical studies, became an electrician and devoted his life to the anarchist ideology. Multiple times he referred to anarchism as the best way to organize a society and he limited the use of violence to self-defense. His definition of self-defense, however, made him a danger in every state that he was residing in. He proclaimed that the middle class maintained its property through the use of violence, reasoning it was completely admissible to use violence against governments and its people. Revolution was justified by labeling it as self-defense, regardless of this conviction. His life was rather peaceful. Malatesta left London and settled in Italy, where he lived until his death in 1932, surprisingly without interference of the fascists of Benito Mussolini. Emma Goldman died in 1940 in France and Kropotkin died in 1921 in Russia. These three people lived for their ideals, but they did not have to die for them. Aside from the regicides mentioned in the beginning of the video, there are many more examples of anarchists being trigger happy in their attempts to spark a revolution. This video has attempted to give a modest overview of the philosophy behind anarchism, its historical origins and give an overview of several interesting figures within the movement. There are lots of people and events I have not covered in this video, such as the influence of Mikhail Bakunin on the anarchist movement and Gavachol, who was seen as a hero to the French anarchists, causing death and destruction with his bombings during the last decade of the 19th century. The execution of four anarchists in 1887 in the United States after throwing a bomb at a crowd of protesters and police officers and the tragic week in Spain, which led to the execution of Francisco Ferrer, a peer pioneer when it came to educational reform along with over 100 casualties, are just a few that come to mind. For the sake of clarity and brevity I decided to leave these out, though they are worth reading up on if you're interested in it. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you have any questions surrounding the topic feel free to leave a comment and the sources as always will be in the description. Uh, I will see you next Friday.